already here. I see y'all, but I'm sure there's many more. Um, so welcome to Seeking Justice, Caring for Community, Preparing for the Days Ahead. Um, my name is Gary Green. I'm a professor here at United Theological Seminary, um, teach pastoral theology and social transformation. And I'm joined by Reverend Tracy Blackman and Reverend Stephen Belton, who I will more formally introduce here shortly. Um, but I, briefly, I wanna say a little bit about why we're here tonight. Um, this is about creating space for powerful black voices in dialogue, uninterrupted and on our own terms and engaging some of the most important questions this country is, is wrestling with right now. Um, and in the context of what we're doing here, all of these questions in some way will relate to white supremacy. As you know, this is the first, the launch event of a broader series entitled Disrupting White Supremacy. But this event is more centrally focused on something that's going on right now that we will talk about in a minute. So more immediately, we're here because some of those big questions still live at the intersection of 38th and Chicago, where George Floyd was killed. And now as we approach the trial of Derek Chauvin and eventually the other three charged officers that will come in June, those questions are beginning to reverberate again in our communities, the circulation of images, the, the questions, the curiosity and the wondering what will happen uh, when this trial happens in the other trials. These, this is where our community is right now. And we need to talk about these questions because the well-being of both this community and so many other black communities around the country depend on us having these conversations and being able to have them both honestly and in public space. Um, so we wanna wrestle with this question, how to care for this community in anticipation for the trials and all that could potentially come from it. Very briefly, I wanna make some acknowledgements, some thanks. Um, Curtis D. Young of the Minnesota Council of Churches, thank you so much for your support and dreaming with me in terms of making this project, this idea become a reality and for connecting us with both Stephen and Reverend Tracy Blackman. Um, Justin Sabiatanis and all the folks at United who collaborated to make this project happen. Max, Laura, Michael, thank you. Our co-sponsors, the Minnesota Council of Churches, uh, the Amos Task Force of the Minnesota Conference, UCC, and last but certainly not least, both of our guests, Reverend Tracy Blackman and Reverend Stephen Belton. I wanna take a second to, to read a little bit of, about our guests by way of introducing them via their bios. And then Reverend Karen Hutt of United C Seminary will take us into kind of a centering ritual that we will share in together right before we get into the questions. Um, Reverend Stephen Belton is currently the CEO of the Urban League Twin Cities, was named president and chief executive officer of the Minneapolis Urban League in December 2015 following a national search and then eventually led the transformation of the Minneapolis Urban League to Urban League Twin Cities in November 2019, fulfilling a key objective of the organization's strategic plan. Um, he brings a unique blend of experiences and over 30 years tenure in high level positions in state government, public schools and the nonprofit and private sectors. As an attorney, he was a litigator and a partner at one of the city's largest law firms. Stephen is a pastor and preacher who serves on the staff at Park Avenue United Methodist Church here in, in South Minneapolis, uh, married for 37 years to Sharon Sales Belton, the former mayor of Minneapolis. Stephen and Sharon have three children together. <laughs> Reverend Tracy Blackman is currently the Associate General Minister of Justice and Local Church Ministries for the United Church of Christ. As a featured voice on many local, national, and international platforms, Reverend, Reverend Blackman's life work focuses on communal resistance to systemic injustice through the redemptive power of love. Reverend Blackman's religious praxis is rooted in principled discipleship lived out through congregational and community engagement. Her response in Ferguson to the killing of Michael Brown resulted in national and international recognition, gaining her many audiences spanning the breadth of the White House to the Carter Center to the Vatican. Her work is now featured in several documentaries and print publications. I, I, could, I could go on, but I also want to lift up about these two that I, they have been so gracious um, to, to this young professor that has wanted to ask them questions and get in a conversation. 
Um, we've seen y'all on CNN, we've seen y'all on MSNBC, you are voices that our community needs and that the human community needs to hear. And so thank you both for being here. Um, let's center ourselves right now uh, as Reverend Karen Hutt takes us into a ritual and then we will get going with the questions. Good evening. In 1967, Douglas Turner Ward wrote a play called The Day of Absence. The play starts off with this small southern town in an absolute panic. The town folks had gone about their day, but all of a sudden started to notice that something was a little off kilter. Something was wrong. Something was terribly, terribly wrong. They couldn't figure out where half the town was. All of the black people in the town had disappeared a scene from the play. Jimmy, they gone. Henry, they're gone. Not a one on the street, not a one at our homes, not a single last living one to be found nowheres in town. What are we going to do? Mayor, thinking, keep your heads on your shoulders, boys. Put your clothes on your back. They can't be far. Must be around here somewhere, probably playing hide and seek. That's all, Jackson. Yes, sir. Immediately, the mayor says, mobilize our citizens emergency distress committee order a fleet of sound trucks to patrol streets urging the population to remain calm situations not as bad as it seems everything's under control then have another squadron of squawk buggies drive slowly through all nigra alleys ordering them to come out wherever they are if that don't get them organize a vigilante search squad to flush them out hiding but most important of all, get on top of this right now. This is a serious situation. My God, we'll find them. Even if we got to dig them out of the ground, we will find them. Now the play performed usually by black cast in white face goes on to depict the total destruction of this town, absolute chaos without the labor and genius of black people. In many ways, it's sort of the railroad tie in the tracks of white supremacy. Without blackness, whiteness is dangerously feeble. White supremacy becomes non-functional without black bodies. Mm. For blackness, it is nearly impossible to enter into any type of fruitful relationship with an entity like white supremacy that on multiple levels has proven detrimental to the humanity of black America. One form of resistance that has proven highly effective though throughout the African diaspora is the expression of black fugitivity. Essentially, this concept is disavowing any engagement, disengaging from any state government projects that attempt to adjudicate normative constructions of difference through liberal tropes of freedom and democratic belonging. Black fugitivity in his book, Stolen Life, poet and social theorist, Fred Moten, a black studies and literature professor at the University of California, Riverside, uses the term to describe a desire for, to, a desire for and a spirit of escape and transgression of the proper and the proposed. A desire for and a spirit of escape and transgression of the proper and the proposed. Escaping the proper and the proposed government sanctioned destructive of black life brings sanity, self-determination and solace to black people. Let us join together today in a meditation on various historic and diasporic forms of protection, sanctuary, and safety found in the maroon cultures throughout the Caribbean and the North America, in the camp meetings behind the master's house, and our barber and beauty shops, funeral homes, places where there is sanctuary, solace, and sanity 
and where our humanity is non-negotiable. These spaces, spaces that Black people have used to signify and encode sanctuary within hostile places, must be considered sacred. Let us honor these places. Let us honor these spaces by creating visual sanctuaries with our arms. Siblings, let us meditate this evening on the anecdotes to white supremacy culture that may help us destroy the legitimacy of these constructs. Create a container right now with your arms. Create a container. Feel its protection, its safety, its sacredness. And now open your moral imagination to places it may have never gone before. The what if places. And as I begin this litany, and as you look into your arms, visualize the words spoken into behaviors. Maybe they are gestures or impulses. Visualize a new world that the black people in the play come back to at the end of their performance. Let us pre replace the white supremacy culture characteristic of perfection with a culture of appreciation. Can you see that in your arms? Let us replace the white supremacy culture characteristic of urgency with measured inclusive discernment. Let us replace the characteristic of defensiveness with an acknowledgement of fear. Let us replace the characteristic of objectivity with multi-phrenic particulars. Let us replace the characteristic of power hoarding with sharing and listening. Let us replace the characteristic of fear of open conflict with honesty and authenticity. Let us replace the characteristic of paternalism with impactful, thoughtful clarity. Let us replace the characteristic of only one right way with cultural humility. Let us replace the characteristic of individualism with communion. Now that our arms are filled with a new culture, it is heavy. It is exciting, it is buoyant, it is alive. Let us extend it now to one another through all of these images here on the screen. Let us extend it, extend our hands to one another and touch each other's container. Let us touch each other's container with the possibility in mind that we can see and end this corrosive soul sucking institution of American white supremacy. Blessed be, and amen, and ashe. Amen. Amen. So here we are, um, approaching the trial, and you both have, unfortunately, a wealth of experience in these kinds of circumstances. And um, as, as the community approaches this trial, and in anticipation of all that can happen, one of the central questions that we wanna wrestle with tonight is, is how to care for the community in this moment and what should be the role of clergy in doing so. So as both of you think about how important care for community is right now at this juncture, um, and this question is for both of you, what do you feel are the most pressing community concerns right now that clergy and community leaders should be mindful of? I know that's a big question and we'll, 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 we'll narrow, but what are the pressing concerns that you hope clergy are being mindful of right now in their communities? Um, Reverend Black, do you wanna start? Sure. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you, Dr. Green, for uh, having me here. And I'm honored to be here with Reverend Belton. And I also want to say to Dr. Hutt, I don't know what the uh, title is, that I'm deeply moved by that meditation and would love for her to send it to me so I can really meditate on it instead of being nervous in this moment. That's right. <laughs> um, so ask her if I can have it. Thank you. Um, to your question, community leaders, in my opinion, whether clergy or not, must be mindful 
that to be black in America, no matter one's social class, is perpetually to live in some degree of racialized trauma. And it's important to remember that in this moment, because those who show up to stand in solidarity around the state sanctioned murder of George Floyd, may his memory be a blessing, show up bearing that trauma in their bodies, in their memories, in their hearts. For many, these are intersecting traumas. Yeah. The same ways that oppression intersects in life and the same way that those oppressions were reflected as intersections in the lifeless body of George Floyd, being mindful that he was also the victim of racialized targeting. Right. He was in Minneapolis because he couldn't find work in Houston. Yeah. had comorbidities and later was discovered, I believe, to even have COVID. Yeah. Those so, same intersection, intersecting burdens and oppressions that were displayed in his body are the same intersections that will show up at any time that uh, people are needed in the streets to protest injustice. And so leaders must be mindful that George Floyd is not the only reason that people are showing up. George Floyd is the latest reason that people are showing up. Yeah. And we show up with all of that. Yeah. So community leaders must be mindful that people can be triggered from many places. People are hurting from many places. And the only commonality in the collective is pain right. um, and right. hopefully we get to a place of some joy um, but as those who are sent out to be leaders and to care I, I, I'm going to stop there so Reverend um, Belton can get in but yeah. but that's on the top of my mind. Thank you thank you we're going to come back to that for sure. Reverend Belton. Yeah thank you and uh, thank you for um, uh, Dr. Green for inviting me I've, I'm honored to be here to share this uh, virtual platform with you and with Reverend Blackman. And I uh, want to thank Reverend Blackman in particular for beginning the way she did by acknowledging the pain that we carry uh, in our bodies. Uh, I would lift up two uh, important points for us to be aware of our issues. Uh, first is acknowledging and honoring the anger and trauma um, that is in our community. And uh, Reverend Blackman said it well, this is just the latest of them. But there is a, um, there is a compiling effect, a uh, repetitive effect of this trauma that is showing up. Um, but the issue that I wanna raise here, and it's particularly of concern, should be of concern to clergy, is that we have to acknowledge and honor this anger and this trauma, and we have to provide both place and space to process and to right. mourn. Right. Um, we must recognize that hurt people hurt people. Yeah. Let me say that again, that hurting people, maybe that's a better way to understand this, that hurting people are more likely to hurt other people. Right. And a lot of what presents as violence in the moment, and in fact is violent, may also be an expression of the pain and the hurt uh, experienced by the perpetrator. Yeah. Now I lay this on top of the fact that culturally, black people and especially black men do not easily or openly acknowledge their pain or personal suffering. And you've got a recipe there for, uh, you know, the raisin and the sun to use the imagery of the late great Langston Hughes. This is an this is a recipe for uh, an exploding fruit. Clergy can and must create safe spaces to talk about our suffering and to speak to the trauma and pain of the moment and to provide a means to craft hope. I say provide a means to craft hope because too often clergy think of their job is to lift up hope or to create hope or to point to hope. But I believe that true hope actually begins when we're able to craft that for ourselves, to be able to identify that for ourselves, to be able to see that for ourselves. And it is the responsibility or a responsibility of clergy to be able to create the spaces, the places, the opportunities yeah. that establish a means to craft that hope. 
you know, uh, one of the things I love about the black church is the visual, great visual imagery uh, that we have. And the black church, as we know, venerates the image of Jesus as the great physician. And, and what I think we need to be doing in this moment, the issue given this trauma and pain is that we need as clergy to be writing prescriptions, uh, given our authority from the great physician, we need to be writing prescriptions uh, for self-care and for pain management and for spiritual therapy. These are things that are not easily talked about. We are in a community um, that doesn't talk about mental illness or mental health at all, uh, easily or openly. And we don't talk about pain because to show pain, particularly for black men is to show weakness. And yet this is a time that is riven with our pain and our trauma and we are acting out on it. So I begin by saying acknowledging, honoring even the anger and the trauma that is out there. Second thing I would say is that um, too often, um, this is a criticism that is not meant to be as harsh as it would sound, but clergy um, go after low hanging fruit and the low hanging fruit in the midst of the trauma that we are experiencing in the midst of the past George Floyd demonstrations and what will inevitably be more coming up uh, is the people who are in the middle. But what we need to be cognizant of are the people who are around the edges, the lives that are around the edges, who are on the perimeter of social movements. It's easy to see the direct line of fire the victims, the family members of victims, the activists, the protesters, the neighbors, the business owners, but don't forget about the young and the elderly and those who are homeless and who are dispossessed and inconvenienced by marches that disrupt their ability to forage for food or look for shelter. These are people who have less agency to express and to mediate their feelings and concerns. And yet they are very much in the path of the trauma and the suffering and the pain that is out there. And I think too easily we look beyond them because there is such pressing need right in front of us. But I am urging as a separate category of interest and need that we consider those who are on the margins. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And I appreciate, I appreciate Reverend Bowden, you lifting up this kind of intergenerational awareness uh, with, within and, and, and around the movement that we need to be mindful of. And I appreciate both of you lifting up this complexity of trauma that black communities face in this country. Because to a certain extent, as we all know, uh, we've been here before. And unfortunately, as traumatic as George Floyd's death is, and, and still in the pain that we still might experience from that, his death lives in this broader trajectory, this broader rhythm uh, that has been in this country where, where this happens far too often. And when you think about that trauma, when you think about that compiling effect that you spoke of, um, or the, the multi layers to this trauma, what does care look like for our community? And, and let me give a little bit of context. So I'm, I'm trained as a pastoral theologian, right? and which is traditionally concerned with trying to understand uh, how to extend care to community. And, and traditionally that was defined in a kind of therapeutic way. And, and while that is important for our community, especially um, because of the fact that we're not given space to talk about and process these things in a way where we can feel safe and vulnerable without the threat of violence, um, but but that's not all care is for our community. Um, because when, you're, when you are perpetually threatened with either the reality or the possibility of violence, um, my question is, what does care look like for us? You know, in what other ways can we care for our community, maybe socially or structurally or systemically, that move beyond, um, that move beyond kind of this therapeutic understanding of, of developing the resources to stand up under this, but to what extent is doing something else actually caring for community? So I, I, I'm not sure if I need to rephrase that, but I'm, I'm asking, can we complexify, or can we unpack what care needs to look like for our community right now, given yeah, I, the onslaught? Yeah, I, I think that we have to begin by 
recognizing both the complexity and the fragility of our community, um, there's a you know there's a uh, great tendency uh, to assume the black community is monolithic. <laughs> Uh, and yet we know, of course, that it is not. It is extraordinarily complex and layered. Uh, and at the same time, it's because of our history of coming through and overcoming, right. it's easy to make the assumption that uh, we're solid when in fact we are fragile. And so I would like to say that care begins with a pause, uh, with taking a step back and giving it uh, the patience uh, to a prize that it is due uh, and it begins with a pause so that we might begin by suspending assumptions about who we're dealing with and what we're dealing with. Now, I like that old expression of different strokes for different folks to assume that a one size fits all approach to care in these moments uh, is strategically wrong minded. Uh, and what we have to do is recognize that we have a variety of experiences going on at the same time. You mentioned intergenerational uh, issues as part one of the tension points. Well, for some people, this is their first rodeo. This is the first time they have witnessed state-sponsored uh, state sponsored execution of a black man. First time they witnessed this and they are activated and agitated and traumatized all at the same time. For other folks, this is business as usual. For other people, this is an unwelcome reminder of something that we have put in the back of our minds and simply would prefer not to have to deal with, but for the fact that it keeps coming up again and again. And then you've got so many people who are all the way, who are in between all of those extremes. And so if the assumption for care is that one size is gonna fit all, one approach is gonna fit all, or that one group has the answer, of course that's misguided. Uh, what we need in this moment is some coordination, uh, is a recognition of what um, you're doing, what Reverend Blackman is doing, and what everybody else is doing, and so some coordination, a sharing of information. We need a variety of people in our community who are trained to identify pain and trauma and who know the community resources. We need to be able to provide resources for them to be able to do that. And we nerd, need clergy who are have the capacity to help. Every black clergy person that I know, uh, Gary and Reverend Blackman in this community, they are all overloaded. They've got complex demanding jobs. Uh, these are not nine to five jobs, you know that. Nobody who pastors has a nine to five job. It's a 24 seven commitment and it's a 24 seven that you can't control. You may start today uh, with a baptism and end the day uh, visiting somebody in the hospital or in a funeral home. And so they're extraordinarily complex jobs and they are overwhelmed. And so what we also need is some capacity building among our clergy, particularly those who are working on the ground so that they're able to respond in the moment, but also to respond with bespoke tailored care that's specific to their denomination, to, to their uh, congregation, to the people that they serve. Thank you. Reverend Blackman, you wanna weigh in on well, that? What does care look like for us? I would, and thank you, Reverend Belton. I wanna start by saying, this is one of those places where context matters. Um, and I can't speak for your context. I can only speak out of my own context. Right. Um, um, so I'm going to say a few things. Um, it is my experience in movement work that one is not just addressing one's own community, but the community that comes to be because of the trauma that is before you. So people come from outside, um, outside of your region, outside of your neighborhood, outside of your community all because of this perpetual trauma that makes it personal for everyone, right? Um, and so there are those who will come to stand in solidarity because often there are not enough people to make the, the large statement that needs to be made internally, come with good intentions, right? Um, this is important because um, in my experience, clergy have a tendency to assume that they are the leaders. Oh. Yeah. Community chooses its own leaders. 
I'm going to say that again. Yeah. <laughs> community, the community that forms in that moment chooses its own leaders. And while we may have all been chosen by God, that doesn't mean we have necessarily been chosen by that community. Right. Right. So community has to do also with relationships that have been built before that moment. And in Ferguson, in Charlottesville, <laughs> I could name a whole lot of places. There were assumptions made by clergy that because they lead in a congregation that they lead in the streets. Right. And, and that has to be earned. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, even with respect, it is not earned, even respect for that role. So I would say a part of caring for ourselves and community was demonstrated by what Dr. Hutt did, mm. by promoting a different way of thinking, right. a different way of actualizing, a different way of moving that is outside of the construct that has been imposed on us right. as the way we should act. And some of the times I see conflict between clergy and activists and organizers is because clergy want to impose upon the community, the constructs that are born out of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know another way to say that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you can march, but march this way. Mm -hmm. You can speak, but say this and not say that. You can do this because we don't want them to get mad. Right. Because we don't want to do this, right? And so it begins for me, care begins for me as a caregiver as clergy, as acknowledging what my role is in yeah. this moment. Yeah. You have to know your role individually and you have to know your role collectively if right. you're gonna operate as a group as clergy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes that role is different than the role that we play inside of our congregations, yeah. right? Um, a litmus test for me in Ferguson was how many of the young people that were in the streets were in your, in your congregation. If you didn't see them in the pew before this, don't assume you're gonna lead them in the street during right. this, right? Um, and so there's multiple levels of connection that have to be happening at the same time. Clergy has to be able to see all of those different kinds of intricacies that Reverend Belton is talking about. And, and we don't, we're human. <laughs> we don't always see them right away, but be vulnerable enough and be open enough to not assume that you have the answers, that you know what the direction is, accept and acknowledge and respect the leaders that the community chooses. And this is, this is so important, and it makes me think about what Reverend Belton said about basically hinted at collaboration, you know, uh, um, understanding the, 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 the importance of not trying to do it by yourself or engage by, by yourself, but to engage with other community leaders. Because of the, what you just said, Reverend Blackman, none of us have the answers. Every one of us have blind, blind spots that it requires somebody else to help us see. And so if we, if, 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 if I assume, and again, you talk about white supremacy characteristics and individualism, this thinking that we have to do things in isolation, right? Um, but if I assume that I know, or that I can know, devoid of the perspectives of other people, I'm getting myself in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, something I wanted to ask you about, Reverend Blackman, because something you said previously, and you just said it again, you talked about this importance of clergy having a relationship with the community. We are at a point right now where over the last year since, since George Floyd was killed, May 25th of 2020, and it's, here it is, it's March, and the trial is coming up, and there might be clergy in the community who have not spent the last year developing the relationships that you speak about that are so crucial to care, but might wanna show up now. Mm -hmm. what, what would you all say to them in terms of how they can show up? Because, because folks, you know, folks are on this journey at different paces for when this becomes important for them or when this becomes a non-negotiable for them in terms of being participants in the movement. Um, 
And so for those who, who for whatever reason, over the last year, um, in the context of the pandemic, in the context of, of this, this slew of violence that continues, have decided, okay, I, I need to be present. Mm -hmm. What should their presence look like? Well, or, or how, can they, how can they show up? How can they be supportive? You show up by just, just showing up. The problem is not showing up. Movements are fluid. Um, and there's always an opportunity and space for people to show up is that you come with humility and you come with understanding that there are people who have been uh, in this place, in this moment before you got there and that the community may have chosen them as leaders. So you come to serve. In, in Ferguson, uh, we actually had meetings about this as clergy. <laughs> We had our own meetings to say, who are we in this space and what is the role we're going to occupy? And for the most part, we decided that we were the keepers of the story and the protectors of our youth. That's why we were in the streets, mm -hmm. to keep the story, because there is a certain amount of authority that comes with my collar, right? <laughs> And so when people, when news media got the story wrong, when people in the community got the story wrong, when law enforcement got the story wrong, when people who were protesting got the story wrong, clergy were there to bear witness to what was the truth. And that came with the authority of the collar. That authority also was used to protect our young people when we could. Yeah. From attacks against their right to speak their truth. Right. And the way that that truth was spoken was not always the way we talk in church. That's right. Right? That's right. So right. I didn't have to change who I was, but I had to accept that everyone was not going to act like me and still be committed to my role right. of protecting the youth. So I think that's an important part. Yeah. Um, I would say the other important part of gaining that um, respect and that inclusivity in what is happening is that clergy must guard against allowing themselves to be divided from the community or the community's leaders. And this often happens because clergy operate in a whole lot of circles, right? Um, and so in, in Ferguson, I can't speak again, context matters. In Ferguson, I remember the very first um, time that I convened um, clergy because of the killing of Michael Brown Jr. Um, I convened us to have a prayer visual uh, at the police station. It was the Sunday. Michael Brown was killed on that Saturday. It was the Sunday after church. I asked all clergy to meet me at the police station. And I was expecting it to be maybe about 20 or 25 clergy and hundreds of clergy showed up. When I, when I got there, the nation of Islam was waiting. <laughs> when I got out of the car, they blocked the street and made an aisle in the middle of the street for me to walk across, right? Yeah. Hundreds of clergy were there. But what moved me more were there were four to five times more young people there than clergy. And here's the thing, those young people had been there all night. Mm -hmm. I was coming after church, yep. you get what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> they had been at the site where Michael Brown's body was until Michael Brown's body was removed because it laid in the street for so long. And then they marched to the police station, had been there overnight, mm. knew that I was coming, even though I didn't know them. And when I started walking across the street said, there she is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so here were all of these young people. Now, when the police started to see this massive gathering, of course the police chief called, but who did he call for? Right. He didn't call for the young people who had been in the street. Right. He called for clergy. Right. And my greatest repentance of that time is that in that moment, when the police chief said, we want to talk to you, um, I went. Um, a whole lot of clergy went because that's what we're comfortable doing. Right. 
We all went up to see the police chief. So many clergy went up to see the police chief. I could barely get in. <laughs> I was late to the door. Right. I could barely get in, right? Yeah. Um, but if I could live that moment over again and have said to the young people, I should have not said yes to the chief yeah. until I went to the young people yeah. who had been there overnight, who were already beginning to identify their leaders. That's right and say that we have an opportunity to speak to the police chief, will you go with us? That's good. That's so good. I wanna say in your context, don't allow yourself to be divided by, by anyone. Yeah. Do not be divided from the community that you are there to serve. Right. Um, and that's not to say that clergy should be anti-police. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that. That's not the role we play in society, right? Yeah. But if we are there to protect our children and to be keepers of the story, then we have to embrace the nothing with, about us without us. Mm -hmm. And clergy should not be taking meetings, be taking gatherings on behalf of a community that they do not have authority in. That's good. Um, so that's a piece of it, right? And and this is this is what... It makes me think of, um, and this we'll 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 have this question, and then and then we got to move to the next segment. But I'm thinking about it's 2021, and what you said about young people and people who are already there, people who were there overnight, and clergy showed up after the fact. Mm -hmm. And I think about Black Lives Matter in intention with the Black Church. Think about historically, we, we idealize sometimes culturally or you know, in, in society, the black church gets venerated and, and, and for, for good reason. Um, but I think sometimes we assume that it was the majority of black churches or that there was a black church that was in the movement in civil rights. And we know from history, it was the minority of black churches that were actually wanting to get involved with that. Most folks didn't want to touch it. That's the whole reason for the Progressive National Baptist Convention. We don't need to get into all that history. But especially as we think about Black Lives Matter, or you spoke about the Nation of Islam, and you talked about all of these other movements, these Black movements, political movements that, that are engaging in this work in different ways, what is the unique contribution of the Black church in 2021? What can the Black church offer the world um, that is unique and that can, that can participate with um, all of these other movements that are concerned about some of the same things, but that get at the questions a lot differently. You know, it, it occurs to me that um, this, this is a really important point uh, because we are uh, yet, yet another inflection point. Um, right. And um, so Black Lives Matter has certainly accelerated uh, and in some ways, you know, even uh, cauterized uh, a lot of disparate um, racial justice movements in the African American community. Yeah. But we're at an important point. And it seems to me that one of the key things that the Black church can do that it has already done, and I need to back up for a moment and issue a disclaimer. And so I'm an activist, I lead a social justice organization. We are relentless and unapologetic advocates for equity, justice, and power for black people. But, and I lead, but this is my call. Right. This is my call. I don't lead, or it is not my call in the same sense of a pulpit, but it is every bit yeah. my responsibility as clergy and as part of what God has equipped and prepared me to do. Now, having said that, the black church has to do what the black church has always done. And it actually is a piece that I was prepared to respond to in the question you asked earlier of uh, Reverend Blackman. And that is the two things that I think we can do uh, to show up or one to come correct, uh, Lee, which for me means it's about showing up for a continuity of care. It's not about showing up for a moment. It's about being in there for the long run. And that's the thing the black church has always done. The black church is really the original institution created by us for us. And we have been there since slavery, actually preceding slavery, because we did it in secret, but we were still the church. 
and we've done it since emancipation through uh, uh, Reconstruction and Jim Crow through the civil rights era until today. And so being there, being present, you know the ministry of presence is one where you have to be present in order to minister. And so the black church has to be there and has to reestablish itself as we're an institution and we're not going anywhere. We have to change, we have to grow, uh, just, but we understand that we are changing and growing in the context of a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the message of the gospel doesn't change, but our ability to translate that message and to make it real and to make it live in, in the context of the way people are living is really important. The second thing that we have to do that the Black church is essential at doing is promoting self-care. And so I mean that in a couple of ways. One, caring for our own, our own community, putting us first um, and saying that black people are worth the care and the intentionality of this institution being poured out into their lives for their benefit. But it is also espousing a value of self-care. You wouldn't know, and maybe this didn't come as a surprise you were in black men, but I don't believe this happens in St. Louis or in Charlotte and other places. But folks show up here who ain't right. They show up and offer the help, but they need care themselves. Like I said, I know this don't happen where, where you from, or the various places where you live, but here, clergy, community members, lots of folks will show up trying to help others when they are raggedy themselves. And so promoting a value of we deserve excellent care. We deserve the very best that you have to offer. And that requires that sometimes you have to back off and say, I'm not in a position to help right now. Get me back tomorrow, but I got to get eight hours in, or I got to check with my family, or I got to tend to this wound, or I'm still mourning, but I can't give you what you deserve in this moment. We have to give voice and permission to be able to do that. And that's part of coming correct. And so it's both the sense of permanency or at least a continuation that I'm not going to leave you I'm here today, but I'm not gonna leave you. I'm gonna be with you throughout this thing. Whether that's financial investments, it's not about these one time. So I gotta give his $5 now, but I need $5 tomorrow and the day after that too. So it's a continuation of care, but it's also as an institution saying, we have some permanence here. We have some roots. We are part of who you are, but it's also coming correct in the sense that we have to say that we deserve care and we deserve the very best of ourselves and of those of those who are engaging with us and we need to actively create in in our context the, to normalize that the, the, to, to create a circumstance where we don't have to apologize for for saying no to something or for 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 caring for ourselves because yeah, we all yeah. both know how much is asked of us and yep. because of this broader world that we live in it, 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 it you almost feel guilty to care for yourself when, when, when you're being pulled at, um, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. jump on that. Don't jump on that because I know it's good, but, <laughs> but I, I, I want to, sh- I want to move us because, because we, I, I want to make sure that we get some of this, this second segment, um, and, and talking about, about white supremacy. Um, it's hard to think about the image of Derek Chauvin with his knee casually on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes without also thinking about how symbolic it is of the way white supremacy casually oppresses black bodies and denies black humanity. One of the things that I'm perpetually frustrated about, um, and I'm sure that you both can relate to this, but you know, I I, I watch CNN sometimes, I watch MSNBC and, 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 and oftentimes, especially right now, the conversation of race is, is everywhere. It's very loud. And, we talk about race and racism in this country as black folks problem, right? Or something that black people have to, to answer to or respond to. And, and when we do talk about, or when we do hear people talk about white supremacy, what happens is um, it, it, they immediately cut to images of white nationalism or militant expressions of white supremacy, which causes us to conflate this idea of white supremacy with one particular expression of it, and we miss the everydayness of it. And that's the part of white supremacy that I want to to create space for us to talk openly about. 
the way that it sits behind the scenes and creates realities that give life to what happened at 38th and Chicago in the first place. The, the, the way it sets the table for these things to happen so routinely and so ritually. Um, and then when we, when we look at what happened that we focus on that moment and uh, one person's decision versus another, but there's, some, there's so much that converged on that corner that day. And so that's what I want us to, to talk about. And I wanna shift because when we're talking about the black church and even thinking about Black Lives Matter, you know, it, it, we talk about white supremacy this way. I'm really trying to highlight the way that it's a rhythm. It's this, it's this kind of, it's this insidious um, perpetual idea that plays out in society, right? The, the way that reality just kind of effortlessly bends to the presumed priority of whiteness over and against blackness and how it's written into everything. You listen to language, blackmail, blackball, blacklist. I mean, I, I don't have to go there. We know this, but thinking about disrupting white supremacy and protest is a, is a great example of the way both literally and symbolically to disrupt the flow of something, to create space for something new to happen. Mm -hmm. My question for both of you all is, what other ways can we disrupt white supremacy outside of, or in addition to protests? Where else can we put our energy um, creatively to make change when it comes to this, this thing that we're talking about? Let me say, Dr. Green, and I'm going to connect this because it's connected for me. Yeah. Um, I still believe that the Black church is the greatest gift from God to Black people. And one of the reasons that's true is because when we are at our best, we construct a narrative outside of white supremacy. Right. It is the liberating force right. that allows us to see the God in us, yeah. allows us to see the best of us in spite of what this nation might tell us. And when we get to what you're talking about around white supremacy, one of the roles of the church, not just the black church I would suggest, yeah. but also the white church that is in allyship with anti-racism. Mm -hmm. One of our primary responsibilities is the deconstruction of a theology of chosenness mm -hmm. that would suggest that God would choose any people mm -hmm. over another people, mm -hmm. as though that would not mean that God is choosing a piece of God over another piece of God, mm -hmm. since we are all created from the same breath. Right? right? And so a part of the role of the church and something that the black church does extremely well is deconstruct this theology of chosenness that precedes even the creation of whiteness all the way back to the quote unquote discovery of a land that already had people on it, right? And right. so even the document that was That's used good. to take land from indigenous people to annihilate indigenous people was a papal document that said, because these people didn't worship like we worship, didn't see what we see, didn't speak what we see, that somehow they were void of a soul, That's right. right? And it mm -hmm. is the same narrative that is carried through not just in that taking of land, but through the enslavement of people who, let me be clear, were born free. And mm -hmm. even in spite of the history that we are taught about 1619, were free even in the 17th century before this permanent class of enslavement was, was uh, cemented, right? right? And so a part of dismantling white supremacy is dismantling the lies that That's good. support it. That's good. That's and good. that has to happen. It always has happened in the black church with or without education. It's always happened, right? Even when you read Howard Thurman, he talks about reading to his grandmother and her saying, don't read me that part because that ain't, that ain't really what was happening. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's That's always right. yeah, happened right. in our yeah, church, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so the, the question is, when are we going to get back to that, right? Back for some, some never left, some have always been doing it, right? Yeah. Um, and this is the part 
that the church has to play in the dismantling of white supremacy yeah. is truth telling, right? I am not a big fan of truth and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of truth telling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but reconciliation has some steps that you have to go through. You can't go from truth to reconciling. That's right. There's got to be some repentance. Come on, There's come be on, preacher. Repair, right? Come on. Come and on. you can't reconcile what was never together in the first place. That's right. Well, so a part of the role that all churches have to play, black and white, because I'm sure not just black churches are listening tonight, absolutely. is we have to be courageous enough to tell the truth, right? And I love to tell this story. My first trip to Ghana, um, I was sitting, I was a, a student, uh, a seminary student, and I was with a class of predominantly white students. It was just, I was the only black um, person on the trip. And we went into this room of black preachers in Ghana, in West Africa, yeah. right? And one of my instructors said, will you talk to us about the missionaries? And the room got really quiet, right? And then one of the ministers said, I'll talk to you about the, the missionaries, but I need you to understand that while what missionaries brought was something that went into the pot, the pot was already here. <laughs> We already knew God. We already had faith. You understand what I'm saying? And what has stuck with me all these years past since mm -hmm. that is when that minister stood up and said, you have to know your own history. Yeah. The Jesus that you worship, when Herod wanted to kill him, hid in Egypt. Right. Egypt was a part of Africa. Right. Who do you think hid your Jesus? Yeah. Right? Right. And where do you think he learned? Because when you got him back, he was 12 in the temple. Come on. Come you understand on. what I'm saying? And, and so a part over. of what we have to do and what we've always done in the black church collectively is tell our own story and refuse to believe the stories that are told to us. And for our allied churches that are white, we have to begin by deconstructing this notion of a theology of chosenness. Good. That's good. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And oh Lord, so you talk about these lies that, that white supremacy tells. Um, the, the, and, it, and, and, and in and of itself is rooted on a myth that has been made real politically, structurally, and theologically, to your point. And I appreciate the, the theological disruption that needs to happen that you just spoke of. Um, Reverend Blackman, one of the lies that white supremacy tells is that black men are inherently dangerous and, um, and a threat to American society. Ah, but it hasn't always been that lie. That's my point. Yeah. Right? Yeah. When right. we were enslaved, it was not the lie that black men were inherently dangerous. Yeah. Then it was the lie that black men were happy to be enslaved. And, 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 you and saw that the black men were not fully human and not fully human, right? right? But as freedom began to come, as a form of freedom began to come, right. then the images began to change to Absolutely. violence, something to be feared, right? Absolutely. And so a part of the work we have to do is deconstructing the messages that have been told. Right. And not just deconstructing for black people, right. but deconstructing Absolutely. for white people, right? Yeah. Yeah. White people have to understand that the cause of dismantling racism is not on behalf of the liberation of black people. Right. It's on behalf of the liberation of them. Everybody, yeah. You, but I'm making a distinction there, right? Because we never talk about the cost of whiteness. Right. Mm -hmm. We never talk about the cost of whiteness. Right. What is it, what does it mean to a people to be diminished only to the color of their skin, mm. right? And so we have to have these deep conversations about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yes, to fight back against those images that black men and black women, you know, black women are hypersexualized. Absolutely. As Absolutely. black men are considered to be violent. Right. Black women are, are uh, portrayed as being so strong we can bear anything. Yep. We don't get the, the joys and the thrills of being delicate or right. being taken care of. You're expected All of these to are care. We have, exactly. Yeah, you're expected to care. But and we're also, but the, the, the same myths apply 
to black men as well. And the thing that I'm concerned about in, on a daily basis, because it shows up in our clients is the way that black men and black women internalize these myths about themselves. Right. And so some of them not only internalize them, but begin to celebrate them, begin to think of themselves as violent creatures or as hypersexual uh, individuals and like. And so part of the divestment of this mythology begins with that self work. But I also wanna lift up, there's another aspect to this as well. It's really easy for uh, individuals inside and outside our community. So for black people, white people, lots of people to look at the entire issue of dismantling racism, uh, Dr. Green, I think is just too big. There's no way that I can handle this. It's just too complex. And so the natural reaction is to either delegate the responsibility to somebody else or to offload it to somebody else. And we are really good, particularly in this community of creating these intermediaries who are responsible for thinking about who black folks are, for deciding who's efficacious, who's effective, who's honest. And we pass that responsibility on to other people who are even willing to pay people. We have important positions in our corporations that are responsible for mediating these issues and deciding who the effective black people are and who we ought to be working with on these issues. Yeah, yeah. The challenge that I see for this is that it is crippling to the individual and it stifles the momentum of our individual capacity to begin working on this issue. And so I'm strongly in favor of this idea that we can start, you can start. When I say we, I mean individually, we don't have to wait for the big systems approach or for the big uh, efforts to happen, but you can actually start individually because I think the strongest, actually the, the most effective individual medium for transformation is self. And so there's a lot of self work that needs to be done here. And so for African Americans, that means confronting uh, what these issues and what these images are that are so destructive of self and that are so destructive and paralyzing of our own ability to move forward. It affects family systems, it affects individual capacity, uh, but it also means for white folks being able to not paralyze oneself, but to say, I'm gonna dig in. Just let me give you a quick example here. In Minnesota, we have the dubious distinction of having some of the worst, and in many cases, the worst disparities, black, white disparities in the nation. And so in issues like home ownership, the worst in the country, educational disparities, K-8, worst in the nation. And so <clears throat> these are issues that do not require a committee to work on. You can actually begin working on these things yourselves. And if the thing that is holding you back is that you don't know any black people, then start there. Decide for yourself that you're gonna change that because you can change that. And so I'm saying that there's also a commitment in this process, in this continuum of work towards dismantling racism and that requires a personal commitment for transformation. It is a commitment that black folk have to make in addressing the issues that hold us back. Um, I'm living, I work in a community in North Minneapolis. We talk, we are here, gathered here now because George Chauvin was, George Chauvin killed uh, George, excuse me, Derek Chauvin killed George Floyd, one black man. And yet in the community in which the Urban League resides, you've had six or 700 black folks who have been shot during the same period of time. 85% of them have been shot by somebody who looks like the three of us. And so we've got issues ourselves to address because this is a manifestation of these same racist systemic structures that hold us back, that define us, as other and that relegate us to a non-human status so that the choices that we have available to us are frankly inhuman by themselves. Right. We have to address those things. And at the same time, we have to charge white folks who are standing on the sidelines saying, let me in coach, put me in the game. Where can I get in with saying, you need to start with some self-work yourself, with some self-transformation work yourself. And I think part of this is recognizing this is this is why we're having this conversation because you you spoke to both the the agency that black folks have and the choices that we have to make and sometimes you know given the examples that that might speak to or 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 might get co-opted in narratives like black on black violence and y'all know how that y'all know how they, 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 those narratives get peddled but there's not enough conversation about how look at the education system look at the media messages that we get and Tracy what I was getting or Reverend Brackman what I was getting to earlier was, you know, you think about this, this image of, of black men being inherently violent or dangerous that, that yes, to your point became 
around the times of Jim Crow when there was freedom. And so there needed to be another image and another justification to contain or, and crucify black men's bodies. And the way that these images play out for, uh, and, and are inscribed onto black women's bodies like Mammy or Jezebel and these things that you kind of made allusion to. Um, but undergirding those images is this assumption of inhuman, this assumption of black inhumanity yeah. that gets played out in every systemic or structural reality that black people then have to contend with. But when you talk about black youth growing up in this country, um, especially in the Twin Cities, you talk about educational dispar disparity and, and never really having the opportunity to learn yourself as human. Um, and so part of this is trying to have some of those structural conversations that we know are necessary for not only white people to be able to learn to see what's happening. Because most of the time, it, 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 people are not trying to be racist intentionally, and yet they continue to participate unknowingly in the reproduction of a reality that has written into it black inhumanity and white superiority. And it plays out so in, 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 in so many ways. So I think, I think learning to recognize these things, and, and so one of the questions I was gonna ask was about structurally, what has to change for these myths and these lies to begin to be dismantled, not just in the way that we might talk about them, but in the way that we live in relation to systems and structures in this world where we have evidence that this conversation we're trying to have about race is actually making making some ground. Um, so I, I, I wanna just call attention to a, a few things um, because it is true that we have a lot of communal violence and we do need to address that. We need to stop killing each other. Um, it is also true though, that people kill people that are in proximity right. to them. To that 89% of white people kill white people, right. <laughs> just like black people kill black people. Uh, but the media uh, plays a role in the fact that black people killing black people becomes a national story, right? Exactly. And white people killing white people do not. Yeah, we don't talk about white on white crime. We That's don't. Exactly, that was my point. But, exactly. but what bothers me is when we don't talk about it, right? So mm -hmm. the fact that that this is happening in both places, but we only talk about this kind, right. um, is problematic. So I want right. to I want to say that, right? Yes. Um, and again, I'm going to go back to a role that the Black Church has to play, because it is not it is not my truth that black people, if, if black people can know their humanity while they're enslaved, right. I don't buy the fact that black people don't know their humanity now. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we have some struggles and we have some issues we have to deal with with poverty and they are very real issues and they are very oppressive issues. Uh, you know, Samuel Proctor has this sermon that people play over and over for me about how we have a responsibility to make sure everybody gets to the scratch line, ex establishing the fact that we're not starting from a level playing field, right? Yeah. And yeah. even in spite of that level playing field, we go on to excel, yeah. right? Yeah. So the question is, how do we not leave anyone behind? Right. How do we not buy into these supremacist notions um, that have caused us to become divided in our own communities yeah. based on class, yeah. based on sexuality, right. based on sexism, right? Yeah. So the thing about oppression is that it's a fabric. It is right. not something that you can dismantle one bar at a That's time. Right. That's right. We live in, in many identities and an allegiance to keep anyone oppressed is an allegiance to keep everyone oppressed. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I feel about that, right? So we have our work to do aside from the work that white people have to do. And white people have to own what it means to be white in this country. That's right. And I'm not sure that I can agree that racism is unknowingly perpetuated in the ways that it's being perpetuated in our systems, right? Yeah. So, so when we're talking about leveling the playing field, what does that look like? Yeah. It looks like people who hold institutional power, who are largely white people, 
deciding that because so many of our school systems are funded by tax base, that it is not fair to have property taxes of properties that have been devalued, many who have been abandoned, it's not fair for some school systems to be funded on that and then million dollar neighborhoods right. be funded in the same way, right? So if you're serious about dismantling this oppression, then why aren't we talking about ways to put all of our funds into one pool and allocating resources based on humans that, rather than based on zip codes, right? Okay. Okay. So the Casey Foundation says there are 6,300 zip codes in the United States, and only 3,300 of those are home to 80% of poor children, yeah. right? I think I got my numbers right. That's, that's pretty close, right? So if we know how many zip codes have poor children in them, we know where those zip codes are. If we are serious about leveling the pay, the play field and dismantling the institutionalized white supremacy that we deal with these are the issues we began to bring to the pay, to the to the to the table yeah. it's more than carrying a black lives matter banner it's yeah. more than hanging one on the door of your church it's more than just showing up at the uh, protest it is using your institutionalized power to make a different reality right yeah. and that's what we need white people to do with that power right. and at the same time black people are not powerless that's right, right? so one of the things Reverend, Reverend Benton and I would love to hear what you have to say about this one of the things that that confounds me and and saddens me is that black people collectively have more advancement and more wealth now than we have ever had right and yet as we build large institutions owned by black people, including churches that have now become institutions, mega churches. We have not built a new institution for community advancement since the days when we didn't have what we have now, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So when we had little bitty churches with coffee can collectors under people's beds, we built colleges <laughs> and, and schools of, of higher learning and healthcare centers. What are we doing now? And that's that's exactly the 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 like unknown part I was talking about. It not necessarily the the unknown, but it's the fact that the way that that this has been so structured into our reality that we participate in the reproduction of it and the recreation of it. And I think the point you just raised, Reverend Blackman, is is especially important because I think, and this is going this we're not going to be able to deal with this, but I think we need to talk about capitalism. And I think we need to talk about the extent to which capitalism has become not just an economic system, but has become a, a lens through which we, have, we are recreating our own humanity to, to buy into some of the things that, 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 well, there's a lot to say there, but I, so I, let, I, let, 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 me, let, me, let me just, let me just make a quick- Capitalism is the reason for white supremacy. What's that? Capital, the whole yes. reason yes. that we have a racial system of hierarchy is capitalism. Yes. Right? Yes. So so let me let me just jump in on, on this one point. So I you all have probably seen as, as a lot of people talking about this uh, PBS series came out on the black church. In the opening five minutes of that uh, series, there's a clip of Otis Moss the third. Uh, preaching the uh, scripture where the four brothers uh, carry their friend in to see Jesus and lower him through the roof. And he, he makes the point that church folks were standing in the way. Uh, they had position. And then he goes off on this riff about never confused position with power. He says they church folk had the position, but they had the power. And then he goes off on this riff. And, and I think there's that dynamic here. Reverend Blackman, you were asking me about my thoughts about the fact that Black folks, uh, the church in particular, did so much when we had so little. But now that we've achieved so much, we seem to have done that. And so I think this is because we have confused and so many people are aspiring for position rather than power. And so you have a number of church leaders whose real issue is to advance position rather than power. And so you have another individuals in our community whose real issue is their personal position and not advancement of the power. There was an ethos uh, in, in, in earlier times 
when your advancement was tied to the advancement of your people and your people's advancement was tied to your advancement. Right. This was about power. It was not about position. It was the, the elevation of a black physician elevated the entire community, gave us power literally because we had access to healthcare, but gave us power symbolically as well because we had established the capacity to achieve in academic rigor. Right. We no longer are pursuing those things and often we take those things for granted. But this is also a responsibility of clergy to call that out and to lift that up. I love the way how earlier Reverend Blackman said that it is also our responsibility to build a name when these white supremacist structures are not are leaning on our community, are incapacitating our ability to move forward. And similarly, we must hold ourselves accountable as much as we hold others accountable right. for our failures to be able to move systems forward, to be able to move black people forward, to be able to achieve power for all of us, not merely the question of position. And settling for position, in my view, is a very weak and anemic uh, result. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. One final question, and then I have to, uh, we've got to play a video that is going to make some very important announcements about uh, events to take place on March 8th uh, at George Floyd Square. And I want to make sure people in the community, people in attendance have that information. Um, and unfortunately, we won't have time for Q&A, but this conversation has been rich and it could go on for hours. Um, the last question I would like to hear from both of y'all, given, given all of this that we've talked about, where do you find your hope? And what is inspiring you to keep in the, in the struggle? Well, I, I can tell you without uh, hesitation that I find uh, my hope in the resilience of, of Black folks. We've been through so much, and yet we continue to move forward. Um, we stumble forward often. It is sometimes, it is oftentimes not a situation where we uh, are not being knocked down. It's not for being, lack of being knocked down, but we continue to get up. It's it's Donnie McClurkin, we fall down, <laughs> but we get up. I uh, am encouraged always by the way folks get up. You know, I have the privilege to witness at the Urban League folks who come in. Uh, my father would say they raggedy, but right. And some of them ain't rag, some of them ain't even right. They just come in raggedy, but they keep coming, you know, and the yeah. pathway to success for on the individual level for black folks is rarely linear. It's rarely the case where you got up, you went to college, you graduated, you got, I mean, those are the exceptions. I don't mean to say that there are not black folks who don't have linear pathways of success, but often in the people that we serve, they come, they engage for a couple of months and they disappear because life happens, gets in the way. They may catch a case. Right. They may go through a divorce. They may have a child that's ailing. They may have a physical ailment, but they'll show up six months later and recommit themselves. They'll get their training. They'll come back. And next thing you know, they want to accelerate their training. They got a little taste of something. They want to start a savings account. And then they want to actually purchase a home. Uh, and then they start an education account. And then one of their kids wants to start a business. I love these stories of resilience, and it strikes me that they are living out the gospel, which promises them not that they will uh, live a life that is without valleys. It promises them, indeed, that they will walk through the dark valley, but it also promises that God is with them, and we live with people who have God in them, who are living out that gospel, you know, despite all the challenges that are from them. So that gives me hope. I would also say I'm also encouraged by the activation. One of the things that has happened here, and I know because one of my friends is Mike McMillan, who's the president and CEO of the St. Louis Urban League, and he talked about the fact that one of the things that happened, nobody would ask for it, nobody would request it, but people were activated. And we know they were activated all over the world by Michael Brown Jr.'s killing, just as they have been activated by what has happened to George Floyd. And so the level of intentional, deliberate activism that has been sustained, we are here now 10 months after George Floyd. Typically, these things happen and they last for a news cycle, but we are still here. The world is still waiting with bated breath. And so all of that capacity tells me that God has not stopped creating. He didn't say, let there be light and end creation there, that God is still creating, still building, still providing hope. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Belden. Reverend Blackman, what's inspiring you right now? Where do you find your hope? I find my hope where I've always found it, um, in God 
and in the manifestation of God's witness in the church. The church is a hopeful place for me. Yeah. When I talk about the church, I'm not talking about the institution. Yeah. I'm talking about the community of believers that gather inside or outside of buildings. There were many tragedies that happened because of the COVID virus. 500,000 people dead in this nation, over 2 million dead uh, globally is a tragedy that we will mourn forever. More people dead in this nation than in World War I, World War II and the Vietnam War combined from this COVID virus and it did not have to be. But one of the things that came out of this virus is that the church had to come outside. And it reminded me of Pentecost. But when the spirit fell on Pentecost, once the spirit fell, the people went into the streets. The church was born in the streets and the church is in the streets now. And so I find hope in the young people who are leading this movement. I find hope in the young people who refuse to back down and they may not do it the way that it's always been done, but they're doing it the way that they feel it. And I'm here to tell you, if you've never been in movement work, if you've never been present, whether that's your call or not, the spirit is there and it is church. And it is a church that is being reborn with room for everybody. It is a church that says, we won't leave anybody behind. It is a church that says, I see you. I see you no matter your gender, no matter your sexuality, no matter your race, no matter your age, no matter your class. And this is the church that I believe Jesus came to, to form and to create and to leave for us to carry on. So my hope is in the fact that we never give up. And that is a collective we. For it's not just black people that are in the street. There are white people in the street too. There are brown people in the streets too. And, and I find hope in that, that as long as we are here, as long as we keep going, I, I wanna say, and I know I'm jumping around, but this is where my heart is about that. You know, when you look at prophets in the Bible, we like to call ourselves prophets. People call us prophets sometimes, but prophets in the Bible were ordinary people. Mm -hmm. ordinary people who have their ear to God and their ear to the cries of God's people. And mm -hmm. I see prophets rising up all over this land. And many of them are not wearing collars and many of them are not mounting pulpits. Many of them are standing in, on street corners and on elevated platforms in the middle of protests. And that my friends is what church is. Wherever the people of God are crying out for mercy, God shows Shows up and the church is born right there. And that gives me hope. I have hope for what's happening in your region. I have hope for what's happening all over this country. I have hope because I still see God moving and I see God moving in the most unusual and unlikely places. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, we're now going to show a, a, a brief video. Now, I would ask that you just hang tight. It's 823. This video is about 10 and a half minutes, but there's very important information. Again, for folks that want to get active and want to participate in what is happening, um, there's going to be some important announcements in this. When we come back from the video, I'll say some very quick closing words. And then, uh, Mike, could you go ahead? Good evening. My name is Pastor Gia Star Brown, and I'm one of the pastors at First Covenant Church in downtown Minneapolis. I also sit on the planning committee for the George Floyd Global Day of Prayer that's happening on Monday, March 8th. Thank you so much for being here for this conversation to learn about how you can get involved in this ongoing movement toward justice. I'm sorry that I can't be there with you in person, but I'm definitely with you in spirit. And we have a lot to talk about over the next couple of minutes. First is, I want to be able to share some details with you about ways you can continue this important conversation and keep it on the forefront. Your presence here lets me know that you agree with me and with so many that this is a conversation that definitely needs to be on the forefront. So let me tell you how we can do that. There actually is a Facebook page, which is called Prayers for Justice for George Floyd and for Black Liberation. 
go on Facebook if you use social media and like that page. And then find the event for March 8th, which is called the Global Day of Prayer. Like the event, even if you're unable to attend, like the event um, and share it with your friends. Share it with your family, your friends, your loved ones. Help us to keep this conversation moving and going um, in the forefront of people's hearts and in their minds. And you may have some thoughts and some prayers as well for those who are coordinating, for those who are right in the middle of this movement. Um, share your thoughts and your prayers. You can actually tag uh, the George Floyd Global Memorial by using the at symbol at GFG Memorial. Again, that's at GFG Memorial. So you can get right on your Instagram or your Facebook, share your thoughts, your hopes, your prayers, and tag the Global Memorial so they can hear your thoughts and your hearts and your hopes for this movement as it continues to move forward. And now let's move into the nitty gritty. Let's move into the day. On March 8th, we're going to start that Global Day of Prayer right at eight o'clock in the morning, Central Standard Time. So at eight o'clock in the morning, there'll be bells ringing, followed by eight minutes and 46 seconds, symbolic, right? Eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence, and then more bells, more bells that are ringing so that we can center ourselves as we move into this day. If you are not local, if you're in other time zones, the encouragement is, is that wherever you are at eight o'clock your time, that you'll join us in silence, in bells, in prayer, in music, in any way that you can um, collectively center yourself with the rest of us, you are welcome and invited to do so. Be a part of this momentous occasion. The second thing we're doing right after that eight o'clock bell ringing will be mutual aid event from 8.15 to 11.30. This is a really wonderful time for us to move from spectators of a movement to participators in a movement. We can do that by bringing items that we can use to funnel back into communities that are most in need. As many of us know, right after George Floyd was murdered, there were so many uprisings and, and the result of those uprisings um, led to people having limited access to the support, the resources, the food, the medicine that they needed. And so a lot of pop-up distribution sites, um, you know, uh, showed up right around the square and in all different parts of the Twin Cities to meet the needs that so many people um, that so many people had. Um, and so those distribution sites, they still continue because the need continues. And we need your help with that. So if you're coming to the square, you can bring one of six different items, non-food related items that we can store and share with people as they need. Let me tell you what those items are. You could bring diapers, sizes three to six. You could bring unscented wipes, hand soap, laundry detergent, toilet paper, menstrual pads. Again, diapers, sizes three to six, unscented wipes, hand soap, laundry detergent, toilet paper, or menstrual pads. At every, at every section of the square, at every entrance, there'll be a table and a space for you to be able to bring your contributions. No worries if you're not able to come in person. Uh, if you go and like that Facebook page, um, you'll get information about ways you can send in a financial contribution that will also go to a fund to provide these same resources to communities and families in need. So one of the things I love about this day is that we're thinking about all of the neighbors, all of the people that have been uh, supporting this movement from afar, from near and far. People all around the world have been supporting and cheering and protesting and marching and praying for Minneapolis and for what's happening here. And so because of that, there also will be this financial, this opportunity to financially contribute no matter where you are to this fund. And there'll be opportunities throughout the day, if you are liking that page, for you to be able to log on and see live streaming of events that are happening so that you can be present um, in the midst of all that's happening. Your voice and your presence, near or far, it matters. So now we move on away from the mutual aid event. Again, that's from 8.15 to 11.30, but there'll be those containers will be available throughout the day. So if you're coming down at three or four o'clock in the afternoon, you can still bring something even at that time to share and to give back to the community. After 1130, we'll be shifting into an initiative that's led by the Black Kings United. This is a, is a time from 12 to 2 that's going to be set aside for the Black community particularly. As we know, African Americans have been historically uh, targeted by the police, primarily our young Black males or our, just all of our black males. And so this is a time for them to be able to share uh, their hearts, 
uh, their laments, their grief, their hopes, not only for themselves, but for the Black community. And it's a time for Black males to be centered, for them to share their voices and to pour their voices and their wisdom into the into our other Black males, into our Black community. And so at this time, it will be a space and a time for the Black community to come together in support, in prayer, in hope, in lament, in rejoicing and celebration for God's presence in our lives and in this space. All of our non-Black allies will be able to gather at another space during that same time to pray, to discuss ways where they can continue to stand in solidarity with the Black community. So even if you come between 12 and 2, there still is a space for you, regardless of your ethnic background. From 2 to 5 is an open mic time. Um, this will be a time for people, um, uh, for BIPOC voices, young and old, to come together. Storytellers, spoken word, uh, music and dancing and singing, all different forms of prayer to come together and to share these voices. And all are welcome to engage, to listen and be present um, during, that, during that sacred time. After that, we'll have um, an update about the status of George Floyd Square, and we'll also have a land acknowledgement from one of our Indigenous siblings, and that will lead us into um, a, an evening interfaith vigil. It'll be an interfaith vigil from about 5.45 to 7, where people from all different faith backgrounds will be coming to share just a few moments of hopes and prayers from themselves and from their community to share with uh, the, the community members of George Floyd Square and with the, the Black community and with the world at large. That will also be streamed. We're really excited that Blavity will be, which is a black owned streaming service, will be the exclusive uh, streaming service that will be used for the various events on that day. And so as you're looking and you're leaning in, if you're not able to attend in person and you are logging on to that Facebook page, you'll be able to see some of these events will be brought to you by, Bra by Blavity. And we're so grateful for their participation and for their presence in this day. So there are so many opportunities to plug in, whether it's coming and leaning into the bell ringing in the morning, whether it's bringing items or sending in a financial contribution, whether it's listening to uh, the voices and the stories of people in the afternoon or praying with us um, in the evening, your presence is necessary and it's welcome. We ask though, for particularly for a clergy presence in the space on that day, that is so important. If you identify as clergy, please come at any time of the day, uh, bring any type of identifying um, garb, whether it's a stole or a collar, anything in your tradition that identifies you as clergy to be a presence in that space. That is so important for us to be able to come together, to, uh, to lean in together, to pray together and to hold space together. If you are available as clergy to come at any time, please, please join us. And if you feel led to help with collecting those items um, during the day, please reach out to me so that we can sign you up for a shift um, at one of those tables um, to collect those items and to also ensure that um, masks are available and hand sanitizer is also abundant we have to take care of ourselves, right? We do. So let me give you a couple of connector emails. Uh, my name again is Gia Star Brown. It is spelled J-I-A. I have two last names, Star, S-T-A-R-R, -R, and then Brown, just like the color. My email is J Star Brown at firstcov with the number one. So one S-T-C-O-V dot org. And I'm gonna ask Gary right now to put that in the chat. Um, and I'll also ask him to put the flyer for mutual aid in the chat as well. So if you have questions, if you'd like to sign up as clergy to help with the mutual aid piece and take a shift of one of those tables, send me an email. And if you also have questions about what's happening on that day, um, questions that you'd like to get answered, please feel free to reach out. And if I can't help you, we'll get you connected. So there it is. So much happening not just on this day, but my goodness, this is, as we know, this movement is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And thank you so much for being a part of this marathon, of leaning in, of being present, and of witnessing all that we know is taking place, not only in this community, but around the world. Change is happening, and just by being here, you're a part of it. So thanks so much, and peace to you tonight and going forward as we step together toward justice. Peace. So you have some information, you've got some emails and some ways to connect um, so that you can continue to fill in the gaps in terms of what information is, is happening and, and what you can participate in. 
let me say from the bottom of my heart, Reverend Stephen Belton, Reverend Tracy Blackman, I appreciate y'all so much. Thank you so much for being willing to talk with me and let me pick your brains. Um, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. We did not get to even probably uh, <laughs> two thirds of the questions, um, but, but that just means that we need to stay in conversation amongst ourselves and, and with the community. Thank you to everybody that came out tonight. Um, I, I appreciate your presence and I hope that this was helpful. I know that it is incomplete, but so is the movement. And so we have to get busy, we have to stay busy and, uh, and we have to have hope to know that if we continue to do this work together, we will create a different reality uh, where people do not have to fear for their lives. We will create a different reality where all of us can be fully human together. Um, and so that our kids can continue to do that as they grow and as this world heals itself. Um, amen, Ashe, and thank you all. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Green. Nice to meet you, Reverend Belton. Nice to meet you, Reverend Blackman, and Reverend Dr. Professor Green. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much for inviting us, for inviting me, and for uh, providing this opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you. Both. Thank you for all of those who joined us online. Yes. Yes, and stayed a little bit after to, to hear all the announcements. I appreciate y'all. And great questions and comments in the chat too. Y'all were yeah. just blowing it up. You get to go, you get to that. Um, that that that's the, I have to teach like that. My students that ask some great questions during during class, and it's just like, well, I can't. We can't get to all of this. So, <laughs> um, but you all be safe. Um, thank you for your work. Thank you for your ministries. Um, continue to show my generation what we need to do and how we can how we can build upon the work and the legacy that you all are laying for us. And we will and continue to do that for the younger, my daughter's generation. <laughs> and every once in a while, you have to show us too. That's yeah, right. No question, That's no question. Right. Right. <laughs> That's right. Amen. Yeah. All, right. all right. Good night. Be well, everybody. Be safe.